you're in the classroom with all the smoke. It's not like you didn't breathe any today. You're just larger than the bird. You're not going to die quite as quickly. And three, then you have to go outside and get cold. I would honestly rather stay in the classroom. That's why I'm going to leave, by the way. You know something's up when I walk out. Okay, go. Um, so, yeah, people wouldn't necessarily die straight away. I mean, you probably got like a lot of health issues from it, but you wouldn't die straight away. But that would make people really, really sick. And then people would also have, you know, 10 to 12 hour work days. And that's without a single break. That's without, you know, you don't get a lunch. If you're going to eat while you're working, you're eating while you're working. And you're probably not going to eat while you work. It's so like, you know, when you're in school, like college, high school, you're like, okay, well, I have to go to school. I have extracurriculars. I have a job. Like, I'm doing that 10 to 12 hour day. You're not doing the like a 10 to 12 hour day. Like, you have breaks. You go home, you take a nap. You rush to work because you took your nap. Um, it's not quite like a 10 to 12 hour work day. Whereas these people, you know, you were already probably sick from where you worked. You had to work a 10 to 12 hour work day. You couldn't take sick days. You would just get replaced if you took a sick day. You really couldn't afford to do anything. Like you lived in they lived in conditions where, and worked in conditions where, you would be very sick, which would make it even harder to work and would make you make it so you get replaced. The other issue was wages. Um, people at this time were generally making at least one to two hundred dollars a year less than was the than what the livable income was. So because the wages were so low that people weren't making enough money, children and women had to enter the workforce because like, an entire family had to be part of the workforce. So and when the women and children um, entered the workforce too, that also made it so the, you had less job security and the wages dropped even lower because there were more people fighting for the jobs. Yeah. So when you say that they were making more than the livable wage, are you saying like to just barely get by? Yeah, the livable wage would be like what you could, what you'd be making to comfortably live. Okay. Whereas they were they were making one to two hundred dollars at least less than that. Okay. So they were like way off what the living wage would be. That'd be like to be able to be like middle class like, okay. to be able to afford food and to also afford some comfort. Okay. Um. So. Women and children not entering the workforce, that also brings the wages even lower because there's less job security. And women and children are obviously lower classes than men. So women and children can be paid less as well. So with women, there was this feminization of certain jobs, um, like secretaries, that's seen as a very feminine job nowadays. That's because of the Industrial Revolution. That was a job that, it was a job that you had to train for. But if you gave it to women, you could pay them less. So you, they were getting trained, and they were getting paid less. And then when men got those jobs as well, you could pay the men less because the women were all the women had just brought down the general pay of the job. With children too, children was child labor. Um, Children brought that down as well, and children usually worked in really, really unsafe conditions. I mean, everyone did, but it was like the machinery. Um, the machines, you know, would break, and when the machines would break, someone would have to fix them. But, you know, you have to be efficient about fixing machines, so obviously you can't turn the machines off. That's crazy, the things that you would stop, the gears and whatnot. Um, so the machines would still be running, so you could still produce things, and you would like stick your hand in, and hopefully your hand wasn't cut off. And if it was, oh well, you're fired. You're probably gonna die. You didn't have health benefits. Crazy. So a lot of times, children would do those types of jobs because they had small hands. Um, they would also do with like mining jobs. You know, you would be in like small spaces that people would need to get into, and those were usually easily collapsible. So, but children are expendable. So many of them, crazy. Um, so women and children and immigrants also entered the 
labor force that made it so that wages went down. So immigrants, women, and children entering that caused the wages to either go stagnant, stagnant or drop. And if you're already making so little money that you're barely getting by, the idea of your wages dropping is not going to be a good idea. So then, to get rid of all these issues, you would want to unionize. Now, with unionization, it's like the idea of like 100 is better than one. So, you know, like um, my sister graduated from high school three years before I did. And when she graduated, they couldn't like decorate their caps. And then when I graduated two years ago, we could decorate our caps. It's like the idea of like one person complaining isn't going to change that, but they all like got together. And that's why that rule changed, or like everyone got together to complain about that hat rule, and that apparently is not a rule now, and it was when I was here. Though it sounds very, very confusing, so <laughs> maybe it still is, I don't know. Um, but it works kind of like the how businesses work with the economies of scale, where you have a small business, and the small business isn't always going to do that great, or it's not going to make as much money, but if you have a monopoly, you can drive out those other businesses, and you can make lots of money. It works a lot in the same way, but with people. Where if you have a lot of people, you can, you know, you can get what you want from the companies a lot easier than if you're just one person trying to get it. And most of the time, they would use collective bargaining. Which was the idea that you'd have a lot of people going and telling the company what they wanted. It was just that idea of getting together because 100 is better than one. So originally, the unions that were around, it wasn't like the idea that we have of unions today. Originally, what was like thought of as unions weren't really unions. They were just small little conglomerates of people that had very similar ideas. Um, but they didn't all work together. They didn't find common ground. Nothing was streamlined. So you couldn't really get much done with that because if you're not all working together, you know, you might have like five people and five people is better than one person, but five people isn't as good as a hundred people, obviously. And you can't really get much done against a monopoly with five people. So that changed though in 1873 with the panic of 1873. Which was caused by railroad speculation. Um, they were going to build a. They're going to build a second transcontinental railroad, and they had to. The company, of the corporation that were doing that, um, had to get a loan from the bank, but they didn't end up making much money off of their other endeavors. And they couldn't pay the bank back. So the bank had lost a ton of money. So because the bank had lost money, people were taking money out of the bank because the bank wasn't financially secure anymore and banks were shutting down. So they didn't end up making another railroad. So everyone was losing all the money that they had put in there, that they had lost, like put into the railroad speculation. But also because banks had lost so much money, they did a credit freeze. So a credit freeze is just when you know they stop loaning out money. But if you're a business, in order to take risks, you have to have money. So if you have no way of getting money, you can't make risks, which means that you can't hire more people. So the big corporations, they could they could do more because they didn't actually, you know, they didn't need to get money from the bank. But most of the time, they really didn't. You know, you kind of work with what you had. Um, smaller companies, though, they couldn't, you couldn't make new business. And that caused more, that caused it, uh, there, that caused there to be no growth of jobs. But because 
that meant that the railroads also couldn't get money back. They started, I was saying laying off earlier, and I realized that's such a nice way to like phrase being fired. They're all fired. They fire a lot of their workers. They couldn't pay them any work more. So a lot of the workers were fired. And that made it so people, it kind of showed that there was really no job security no matter what. Um, and people wanted job security. So there were already, there were some large unions that were around that were kind of what we think of today, but they didn't really have a lot of prominence in the community until after the panic of 1873. So in the 1880s, there was two labor groups that really like took off kind of, they already existed, but one of them was the Knights of Labor. which became more prominent under Terrence Cowdery. And it was seen as a very progressive labor union. Um, they were open to unskilled workers. And unskilled workers are just people that don't need training for their jobs, like factory workers, whereas skilled workers would be, you know, like people that have to have training, so like secretaries and teachers, those would be skilled workers. And you could be a skilled worker and be in the union. It's just this one was also open to unskilled workers, which makes it an industrial union. It was also open to women, African Americans, and immigrants depending on where you were in the country. But it was very progressive because it was bringing a lot of people together to fight for what they wanted. So obviously though, they have, I mean, they have goals beyond just getting higher wages. One of the goals was an eight hour work day. And an eight hour work day would mean, oh, sorry. Uh, so it grew to prominence under Terrence Power Week. So an eight hour workday would include like more of what we have now where you work for a certain number of hours and you get a break. Because back then, you know, they didn't have that, there was no breaks. So you'd get a lunch break, you'd get like 15 to 20 minute breaks. You would be able to go home at some point. They also wanted more cooperative companies, which was seen as a very socialist idea. Um, because they wanted to have a say in the way, in the capital, so the means of production. They wanted to have the company be like made up of a board, and then a worker would be part of that board to say what the workers wanted, what they felt like could be more efficient, what they felt like could really help the workers do better. And part of that is obviously the workers going like they have, they live or they work in good conditions. Um, another one was to end child labor and also prison labor. Um, you know, you can basically, and we still do, you can have prisoners work for almost nothing. But they wanted to end prison and child labor. And I feel like when you say, like, yeah, let's end child labor, that sounds so nice, except for the fact that it's not because, like, children were people to them. That's insane. Children? No. no, it was more children just brought down the wages. So, any child labor means that your wages go up because there's less people to fight for your jobs. But obviously, just being like, well, we want to get rid of child labor because... It makes it so our wages go down. Companies aren't going to listen to that. They're going to be like, yeah, that sounds awesome. So when you end child labor, it's because children are human beings that you love. Which, like, yes, nowadays people are like, babies are so cute. Back then, they were like, babies are workers. Look at my worker. Child labor would also make it so that women, um, especially at that time, would also leave the workforce more because you obviously need someone to take care of children. So that would also mean that people would do, like the number of people in the workforce would go down, which would be good. Your wages go higher. 
They also wanted equal pay. That was just between men and women. Um, because of those jobs that were seen as very feminine, if you made the pay for women and men equal, that would make them so those, those jobs especially would go up. But all jobs would go up because you're not competing with the wages that women would work for. You're not like, well, I'll take a lower wage because this woman can get my job and work for even less. Instead, it would really be based off of you know, who actually has a job. You're going to get paid what you're going to get paid. We also just want better working conditions. <laughs> um, better working conditions would basically just be a lot to fix most of these. Um, you know, we talked about these and then the wages, but there would also be like, you're not going to have your hand cut off in the middle of work. If you if you worked with chemicals, you could fall into your chemi into the chemicals and die, and then you'd be part of the chemicals. So like you worked with lard, you become part of the lard. People would eat you. <laughs> think about that when you eat pie. When you make pie crust, think about that. <sighs> You're not eating people when you eat pie. Anyways, it to make it to make it you know safer. Um, and also to make it so like the air was safer, and then everything else, and anything that you could possibly think of that would be like bad working conditions is not going to help fix those. I'm running out. So. <laughs> so another thing would have been a prohibition on foreign um, contracting. That would be like having a factory in a different country. So instead of having the factory be in the United States, you would have the factory yeah, be in a different country, which would make it so that there were less jobs in the United States. So if they put a prohibition on that, companies would have to build more factories in the United States, which would mean that there would be more job security because you're not, you're not fighting with other people as much for jobs. More people have jobs. The whole reason you don't have job security is that people will replace you easily. When people will replace you easily, it's a lot easier to make off. It would also mean that wages would go up because more people would be working. So if you worked for a company and you didn't like what was going on, you'd be like, well, I'm going to leave, and I'm going to work for this company that needs workers because more people are working. So the other labor union was the American Federation of Labor which is known as the AFL. That gained prominence under Samuel Gompers. Not the fourth time I said his name today, it's never gotten thunder. Or it's never gotten less funny. <laughs> it's been so fun all day. All right. So that gained prominence under Samuel Gompers. Um, this was only for skilled workers. So or this one would be unskilled or skilled. This one was only skilled. And if you're only a skilled workers union, that's called a trade union. They were also really only open to men that were white. Um, if you were a skilled worker and you were a woman, <laughs> tough luck, you could join. And some of the goals that it had was the same. Um, the Knights of Labor were a lot more progressive in their roles. The AFL had certain similar goals. Um, it wanted an eight-hour workday. And they also wanted better working conditions. What really differed was the way that they wanted to have higher wages was very, very different. They didn't really want the socialist idea of having a cooperative um, company. It was more, we like the way that things are going. We like capitalism the way it is. We just want a bigger chunk of the capitalistic pie. So there's a lot of higher wages. So obviously companies, because unions, make it so that the people on top don't make quite as much money. Companies don't like unions. But 
when a company compares this to this, they want this more. So like in the short run, when unions are formed, money has to be taken away from the top to go to the bottom. But when that happens, people, the workers will spend their money because they have to spend their money even when they don't have food, you have to spend your money on food. And that creates more jobs, which people then spend more money. And that ends up going back to the company and the people on top get the money again. That's how, that's how it is in the long run with unions. In the short run, people lose money. And that's really what people look at when they talk about the unions and losing money. Is that in the short run, people would lose money. So people definitely, the government and the companies preferred the AFML because it meant that in the short run, what they wanted really was something that would cost less money for the company. And then both labor unions liked to use collective bargaining, but they would also strike a lot. Um, the AFL was a lot more hesitant to strike because they wanted to seem less radical, but they would strike when collective bargaining didn't work. Because collective bargaining was literally just bargaining with the company to get what you want. This is going to get erased. So when they would strike, there were some specific ways, like methods that people would use. One of them, uh, I feel like the striking methods are so like, self-explanatory, it's kind of funny. They should try all of them. One was sit-ins. One was sit-ins. Um, sit-ins was you would go into the factory or company or corporation and you would just sit down. And you wouldn't do any work. But then that also made it so that nobody could do work because you were in the way. So if they tried to bring in other people to work, you could be in their way. You could stop them from working. The means of production would completely stop them. You would also do walkouts which are the exact opposite of students, where they would go to work, but then they would all walk out, and then you would kind of stand outside the building so that nobody could get in. So then if they tried to bring in workers, the workers couldn't come in. Um, if anybody decided that they wanted to stop striking, they couldn't go back in because you stopped them. And but all of this was just to stop the means of production. That's like how the strike works. So we stop lease production, we stop the company from making money, and the company has to get back to you to get into your demands in order to make money. Obviously, though, companies don't like that. The entire idea of a company is to make money. So they would push back. One thing that they would do is they would hire scabs. Scabs were people that would take, when people were on strike, they would do the jobs. So um, that's why they would try to stop people from getting into the factory, because that's like the staff's entire thing. If you're not going to do your job, then pay somebody else to do your job, and you just won't have a job anymore. They also have walkouts. Um, if they thought that there was going to be a sit-in, they would have a walkout, which would just be that they would walk everybody out of the factory or wherever and then they would bring some scabs to the jobs but if you're locked out it's a lot harder to get people to not come in because and most of the time too you wouldn't be as close it would be a lot harder to get people to not go into the factory people would be blacklisted the workers would be um if they talked about strikes talked about unions um, we're planning one. The company would tell other corporations and other factories and whatnot who that person was so they wouldn't get hired. Because when you have someone who, when you don't have that person working around other people, it's a lot harder for them to spread their ideology. So if they're blacklisted, they can't spread that to other people. So like the idea would be like get as many people blacklisted as possible, and they can't tell the people about that. 
Uh, workers will have to sign yellow dog contracts. Um, a yellow dog contract would be if you were going to work for a company, you'd have to sign a contract saying that you wouldn't talk about striking, you wouldn't talk about unionization, you would never join a strike, you wouldn't join a union. Um, it was called a yellow dog contract because it was seen as pretty cowardly, so like a yellow dog coward. Um, it was seen as cowardly because you had these huge corporations that really should be able to put down, you know, whatever, or should be able to give in to the demands. And instead, they're too scared to even let people talk about it. They would also have um, Pinkertons and militia. Um, Pinkertons were like, like a private guard um, that the company would have. Pinkertons would work as sometimes they would infiltrate the company and they would pretend they were a worker and then people would talk about the strikes and they would talk about unionization and they would report to the top people about what was going on. So like that's how they would know to do lockouts. Or that was how they would know to block those people, was because the Pinkertons would tell them who it was. Pinkertons also would help scabs um, get into the companies during like sittings and lockouts, where they're like bodyguards. So people wouldn't want to mess with them, and then you could get good work. The state could also, um, the state could send militia to fight the strikers. So you'd actually have like an organized truth. All right, so then going back a tiny bit, because this is in the 1880s, this became very prominent. In 1877, there was, a great, there was the Great Railroad Strait. So it wasn't as much a strike as it was an upheaval. Um, because of the panic of 1873 and the issue with railroad speculation and railroads not making as much money, a lot of railroads were cutting people's wages. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, though, was actually doing quite well. Um, but other places were cutting wages, so they great way to make money. So when they cut wages, when you already have, you know, you're not making enough to get by, and then someone cuts your wages, and it's not the first time they've cut your wages, you're kind of fed up with it, and they stop working. It wasn't like a planned strike. It was just it happened, and they were like, nope. It's going to swear, but that's fine. Right. Um, so in Pittsburgh, because this started in West Virginia, and then in Pittsburgh, they did call the militia in to stop the strike, but the militia was also treated pretty crappily, and the militia joined. There was like some violence, but in the end, the militia really didn't help because they agreed that they should get paid for it. So originally, the federal government didn't really couldn't do anything about it because it was just in West Virginia. And, you know, your state militia can do something, but no one else really can. But it spread to other states. And when it spread, the federal government was able to cite the Commerce Clause. Was able to start cite the Commerce Clause, the Constitution. Because the government was with the companies. They wanted the companies to be able to produce because that was how people imported and exported goods. That was how the government made a lot of money. So strikes really caused issues for the government and their ideologies as well. So when it spread across state lines, they were able to set the Commerce Clause, because the Commerce Clause says that you can't stop distribution of money between state lines, you can't do something to hinder that. And the railroad strike slowed it down. So they said that that hindered the distribution of money. So a little bit before this was the Reconstruction time period, you guys know? And when that stopped, a lot of the troops that were part of the reconstructionism just went into the army. And all of those troops 
for African Americans. So they sent those troops to stop the railroad strike because government could actually do something about it. And whereas originally the militia had joined, the militia were white. There was like this common idea between the people that were both being treated pretty horribly. When the troops came and they were African American, there was this idea of racism. And people were like, no, we don't want you to have the same rights as us. And that caused it to be put down because they didn't want the African American troops to join in on their strike. So it didn't really work, but in 1880, they did, um, because there was such a spotlight on the company when this was going on, the railroad workers did get some better working conditions, but that was mainly just to stop them from striking again. You know, striking does hinder your means of production, it hinders your money. So if you give people what they want in at least a little bit, you know, like you give them an inch, then they'll stop asking, at least for a while. One of the other incidents was in 1886 with the Haymarket Fair. So the Haymarket Affair originally, it was a strike that was around the nation and it was for an eight hour war day. And that was original May 1st, they had this strike for an eight hour work and that was everywhere. And that was more associated of the Knights of Labor, with the Knights of Labor. Um, there were about 80,000 people that participated. And the AFL, some people from that did join in too, like it wasn't the AFL wanted, but people largely associated with the Knights of Labor. Like they were the ones that really organized it, they were the ones that were putting together the strike. It was a it was a peaceful like strike and, and protest, I guess. And the police that were like there at the protest opened fire in Chicago and killed people. So then on May 4th, so three days after this protest, um, in Haymarket Square, which is in Chicago, they protested police brutality. Once again, that was a peaceful protest. It was like really just people sitting in the square, like picnicking and just protesting the fact that people had been killed during the strike. However, I don't know if any of you have noticed this, but sometimes people take things out of hand. Uh, when you get in a big group, some people have much more intense feelings or ways of doing things. And somebody threw a bomb. And the bomb ended up killing seven police officers and injured like 67 other people. And it caused a lot of distress and it caused a lot of distrust in the labor unions. The, the fact that like labor unions would go to this extreme because this was associated with the Knights of Labor and their protests. This also made it so that, that was really the beginning of the end for the Knights of Labor. Um, they were already seen as extremists because of their socialist views, like with the cooperative companies and whatnot. But this made it so people like, they're radicals. You know, they're bomb-throwing anarchists and they need to be stopped. And um, they're trying to put down our nation and trying to put down the economy. So membership in the Knights of Labor went down because of that. But people also just had a larger distrust of unions in general. There was also one more strike. In 1892, there was the Homestead Strike. Which 
which was in Pittsburgh. So this was at a Carnegie steel plant. And there was there weren't really any unions associated with Carnegie Steel plants, except for the one in Pittsburgh, which was the Homestead plant. And there was one union that was there. And there was kind of this idea that, you know, if that union is able to survive, then it's going to spread its ideology to other steel plants, and they're going to form unions, and they're all going to, like, rise together and ask for things that would make their lives better, which is a horrible idea. Who would ever do that? So, Carnegie, though, because he was such a charitable man, didn't want, I mean, he wanted to put down the union, but he, like, he didn't want to put down the union because he was charitable. You can't not give people what they want when you're charitable. Hey, good living conditions. Crazy. So he went to Scotland, and he left his chief lieutenant in charge, who was, I'm going to move this out of your guys' way, it's like right here. He put his chief lieutenant in charge, which was Henry Clay Frick. So what they did was they cut wages. And the wages caused it so people were going to be on strike. So, so they organized, Frick organized a lockout, but it was a much more extreme lockout. Like the fence that was around the factory had um, barbed wire on it, they had machine guns so that people really couldn't stop the scabs from coming in, or at least that was the idea. Then they had Pinkerton, there was a like river behind the factory, and they had Pinkerton bringing in scabs on like small boats and bringing them into the factory to work but the strikers knew about that and they like rebelled against that and became very violent but there were like 13 strikers that were killed but the strikers won so they stopped being able to bring the scabs in so and originally in pennsylvania the governor didn't want to bring um, the militia into everything. He didn't want them to get them involved because public opinion was for the strikers. They're like, yeah, you're, I mean, your wages are being cut. There's no reason for them to be cut. Carnegie can definitely afford to have your wages stay the same. So original public opinion was for the strikers. However, all that changed when um, when there was an attempted assassination on Henry Frick. There was an attempted assassination on Henry Frick, and people once again saw this as being a radical idea. This was something that the strikers and the unions were a part of. It reflected badly on the strikers and the unions, because this was how people saw them getting things done by like killing people or attempting to kill people and it came back to the idea of radicalism where these people are anarchists they're going to destroy our way of life they're going to just destroy the nation and the economy and that made it so that public opinion turned against the church so then they did send in the militia so after five months this is a really long strike um, five months, they were able to stop the strike, but that was, it was very violent. Um, you know, people were killed and when people are dying around you, you're like, maybe I don't want to hang out here. So people were leaving the strike. Um, and after five months, it basically disbanded. But this man, it's like Carnegie totally got his way. I mean, his whole point was that he didn't want there to be a union because he didn't want to have to give it to union demands. 
So other steel plants saw what was going on when the union tried to fight back and the strikers tried to fight back and it made it so they didn't make unions. They didn't build anything. Whereas, yeah, and that kind of spread to all the steel plants. There really wasn't any unions in the steel industry until about the 1930s with the New Deal because there were different labor laws. But until then, there weren't going to be any unions really in the steel industry. And that is all I have for you guys. Any questions? Great, nice job. Good. We have time to do the president's quiz? No. <laughs> all right, good job. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. I'm losing my voice now. Oh, yeah, it's amazing how quickly it goes. You don't think about it. Good. Tired? That's exhausting. Mm -hmm. It's only the whole day. Well, the thing is, some people are going to get the arm. You walked in and I realized I was saying Melissa wrong. Yeah, but I was like, we're changing. It happens, it happens. There's also the issue of assassination is a long word. And you can't pass the faculty to this. It's like every time, like, I was like, oh, right. You know, I have to keep on writing. Yep. <laughs> you go from there. Good job. Trust me. You did it for a year. Yeah. You're doing it for a year. It's going to get to my teacher. Just figure out what you're doing. Yeah, the writing stuff down. I never even thought about that. Like, how much easier it would be to write these down. Yeah, it was a really good. Some of these names are so funny, though, and I don't feel like they got like less money from the entire thing. No. <laughs> Gompers are funny names. Yeah, Gompers, funny Gompers, names. Gompers is great names. Yeah, I really did the same thing. Some of them get it. It's so weird, just like what you notice too, when you're looking at people at your language. There's some students that think it's easier to look at some students. <laughs> But I would, yeah. there was something about it, something stupid. I don't have to think about it. Y'all have an issue, I'll be like, oh, you have the time to look at it the entire time. You can talk to it. I just have to use a coffee to use. I don't know. I would notice that I'd be like, it's not as good as weird.